welcoming Christ Jesus to our online worship this Palm Sunday, also known as the Sunday of the Passion. We can gather through this online means and continue to praise our God and Savior. Some of you may have gotten the palm branch that you could have colored in and cut out if you'd like to hold that too. Order of service today is a bit different for this festival's celebration. Please stand if you would like. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Dear friends in Christ, for five weeks of Lent, we have been preparing for the celebration of our Lord's Paschal Mystery. Today we join together to begin the solemn celebration of Holy Week. Christ entered in triumph into his own city to complete his work as our Messiah, to suffer, to die, and to rise again. Let us remember with devotion his entry that culminated at the empty tomb and follow him with a lively faith. United with him by baptism, we share his resurrection and new life. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 21. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her cold by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt full of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the gospel of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We sing the first three stanzas of hymn 131. Spirit, 
one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. I celebrate this also as the Sunday of the Passion, as we look ahead from Palm Sunday to the reason why Jesus came to Jerusalem. So we'll have the end of our Passion history today read from the Gospel of St. Matthew. We begin in St. Matthew chapter 26. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. They did not find it, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him. We sing him 117, the first stanza.
They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. We sing stanza two. Hosanna! 
And blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. On Friday, the crowds in the same city are shouting, Crucify him. Now, some people may suggest that Jesus was a polarizing figure, that these were different crowds that were gathering this day. The, the, the one a crowd of his supporters, the other a crowd of his enemies. Sort of like a politician, you know, might come and depending upon if he was meeting with Democrats or Republicans, might get a different reception based on his own views. But that wasn't what was happening here on Holy Week. This was not simply people for, with different views or different outlooks on life. No, what was happening was something completely different. On Palm Sunday, everything was the way it was supposed to be. Jesus is the Almighty Son of God. And here he was, acclaimed for just who he was. God, who had come to his people. He had proven his divinity by his miracles and by his preaching forgiveness. And now he's acclaimed as king by the crowds who recognized him for who he was. Hosanna to the son of David, they said, recognizing he was the rightful heir to great King David. Palm Sunday is the way it should be. On Good Friday, everything seems to be wrong. And yet even in the midst of this later passion history, that is the history of Jesus suffering, his death, even here we have people still proclaiming the truth about Jesus. So many of them didn't know what they were saying. Many of them certainly didn't believe what they were saying. And yet throughout this history, people are moved, according to God's plan, to announce it. Hail, King of the Jews, for Jesus truly is our King for eternity. What do you think when you hear the word current king? Even in America where we don't have a king, we still get the concept. A king is somebody who has got all sorts of power in the land. A king is somebody who's very rich. A king can basically do whatever he wants to. A king then can accomplish all sorts of things. A king is somebody to be feared. In the Bible, there are four gospels or history of Jesus' life on this earth. The uh, evangelist Matthew wrote a history in which he especially refers to Jesus as the king. The one who had been promised throughout the Old Testament. Matthew makes a lot of references to those prophecies. And he shows again and again how Jesus is the king. In the first half of the gospel, Matthew records again Jesus doing these miracles. Jesus proclaiming God's truth to his people so that people would be able to trust in him. And this is how Jesus established his kingdom. This is how Jesus established his ruling in people's hearts. Through his words, through his actions. Even we today, as we read these words, are brought into God's kingdom. And then, the last part, the passion history, we see how Jesus established the whole basis for this, so that we would truly love him, as we see Jesus going to the cross in order to be our Savior. Recalling all that Jesus had done throughout Israel, it's no wonder that the crowds who turned out there on that Sunday were ready to proclaim, hold up their, their palm branches, spread their cloaks on the road so that the donkey wouldn't kick up the dust as he was going along. And when somebody didn't recognize him, the crowd simply said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. But of course, this wasn't the reception that Jesus received later in the week when he went to those who were in the high positions in Jerusalem. Joseph Caiaphas, the high priest, had actually been plotting for a while as to how he could get rid of this Jesus. He was jealous of the crowds that followed after Jesus and, and shouted out their adulation. But he also opposed Jesus because of his message. For Jesus kept preaching about peace. But it wasn't the kind of peace that a king would establish with an army, and it certainly wasn't the kind of peace that the chief priests were preaching, which was that you could find peace with God by doing this, that, and the other thing. Jesus preached that you have a peace, an inner peace, a peace with the Almighty God, simply by trusting in Him, putting your faith in Him as your Savior, a peace that was based upon God's love. So, Caiaphas conspired to get rid of this prophet from Nazareth. It was his men who paid off Judas in order to betray Jesus. His servants went along with the Roman soldiers to 
make sure that Jesus was arrested properly. Caiaphas was the one who gathered the court there, the, the Sanhedrin. He's the one who got the crowd to shout for Jesus' death. In fact, Joseph Caiaphas was actually the judge at Jesus' initial trial. They tried to find some witnesses. That is, they tried to pay off some witnesses. But they couldn't even get witnesses to agree. Their stories kept getting mixed up. Finally, two of them agreed. Okay, yes, this Jesus, he, he said that he would destroy the temple and rebuild it. And in the end, Caiaphas then asked Jesus, Are you the Messiah, the Son of God? And Jesus said, Yes, it is as you say. And he said the day would come when that same Caiaphas would see him sitting at the right hand of the Father and then coming down in the clouds of heaven. You see, Jesus is the king. Jesus is the king of the universe. But his kingdom right now is hidden. It's a kingdom where he rules in people's hearts. But the day is going to come when his kingdom will be visible. When Jesus returns on judgment day, every eye will see him. Even Joseph Caiaphas will be raised up and will have to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is God and Lord to the glory of God the Father. Remember that. Remember that in the days and weeks that are coming. As we keep hearing so much news, so much news that could make us so stressed, we hear about more and more people dying, even in our country, and the economy being stagnant, and the people despairing. Remember that Jesus Christ is Lord and King. Even in the worst of times, He is ruling. And He is ruling in our hearts. He's assuring us that no matter how bad things may be, he will make them work out for our good. This same Jesus who healed the sick, who raised the dead, is watching over us. We may not see his kingdom yet with our eyes, but the day is coming when we will. Until then, we trust in him. We trust him because of what he did while on this earth. The love that he showed day after day. And especially because of what he did in this passion history, that Thursday night leading into Friday. Caiaphas said Jesus was worthy of death, but the Romans were in charge of Palestine. They were the ones with the soldiers, they were the ones with the civil courts, so the Jews didn't have the right to execute anyone. So they turned Jesus over to the Roman governor, Governor Pilate. Now, Pilate is such an interesting character in this story. He clearly was stumped by this Jesus. He'd heard about this prophet, this preacher, this miracle worker, this man who seemed to pose absolutely no threat. Jesus obviously was no king. Kings have bodyguards. Kings are rich. Kings can do what they want. This man had nothing. But the Jewish leaders were insisting that he was a rebel and that he was a threat. And yet, when he was questioned, Jesus refused to defend himself. Pilate asked him a simple question. Are you the king of the Jews? And we might think of that as what they kind of call a softball question. This poor Jesus, they've already beaten him. He's obviously nothing like that. Could have simply said, no, I, I'm no king. And Pilate would have sent him off. He would have said, don't waste my time. Get rid of this guy. I don't care what you say. He's, he's no threat at all. Just a poor beggar. But Jesus, again, said to Pilate, as he had said to Caiaphas, you have said so. In other words, yes, he was saying, I am actually the king. Pilate tried to get the crowd to help him out. Did they want Barabbas, who was a murderer, who was a real threat to their lives? Did they want him released and roaming the streets again? Or would they simply let this Jesus, this helpless teacher, go but the crowds, stirred up by the chief priests, shouted that they wanted Barabbas to be released. And they shouted that Jesus should be crucified. Finally, Pilate literally washed his hands there of the situation and sent Jesus away to the cross. The soldiers kept up the joke about this king. After beating him, they put a scarlet robe on him. They put a, a stick in his hands, a staff, and they gave him a crown, a crown that they wove together of thorns pressed into his head. And they knelt in front of him and they mocked him. And they spoke those words, those words that were actually were so true. Hail, they said, hail, king of the Jews. And the crowd there was, they came, followed after him. 
At the cross, the written notice was placed above his head. This is the king of the Jews. And the chief priests, who hadn't had enough fun there at their court, came outside of Jerusalem to Golgotha, and they mocked him. And they said, okay, king of the Jews, if you really are the son of God, just bring yourself down. Of course, they didn't believe in him. What a sad sight this poor man dying on the cross was. What kind of king was this? And yet, it's precisely here, in his humiliation, that Jesus established his kingdom. Jesus was not a king as Pilate or the chief priests understood. His kingdom would not have walls, it would not have armies, it would not have a treasury, not in this world. His kingdom is a kingdom of peace. Jesus would not establish his kingdom by killing his enemies. He would establish his kingdom by shedding his blood. His kingdom would be one based solely upon the love of God our Savior. This is clear as he hung there on the cross. As the time ticked by, Jesus is being dragged down, the weight of his body dragging him down into death. Death is imminent. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because Jesus truly was forsaken by God. Jesus had taken on himself all the sins of all the world. Everything you have ever done wrong was right there upon him, and he was bearing that weight. Jesus was enduring that suffering, even the abandonment of God the Father's love. Matthew notes that when Jesus died, the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom. Now this curtain separated the most holy place, the inner part of the sanctuary, from the outer part, the, the holy place. It was a place that only the high priest could go through once a year, and that with smoke in front of him to cover up his presence before symbolically where God was located. All of this was done. The chief priest would come in there bringing the sacrifice for sins once a year on the Day of Atonement. Well, when Jesus died, the true sacrifice was completed. Sin, all sin was paid for. Everything you have ever done wrong was wiped off of your record. There is no more reason for sacrifice. There is no more reason for a temple here upon this earth because Jesus has won our salvation. And this is how Jesus established his kingdom. Jesus came to establish that peace with God for all people, a peace that comes through the unstoppable grace of God our Savior. In his death upon the cross, we see just what kind of king Jesus came to be. Matthew tells us that God gave one more glimpse of Jesus' kingdom. He said there's an earthquake, and the tombs broke open, and the bodies of believers were raised to life. And on Sunday, after Jesus rose from the dead, those believers came into Jerusalem, and they were widely seen. This is the kind of kingdom that we look forward to. On Judgment Day, all the dead will be raised up to life. And because Jesus has paid for our sins, those who trust in Him, those who have faith, will be welcomed into a new home in heaven. Remember that. Remember that when you read the death toll in the coming weeks. COVID-19 may take away many people. Other illnesses will kill so many more over the days to come. But all of us who trust in Jesus know that we have a life that extends beyond the grave. That our God has won for us a perfect home with him where there will be no more sickness, no more mourning over death, no more fear, no more viruses. Our God has won for us the certainty of eternal life with him. That's why we could join with the Palm Sunday crowds in shouting out, Hosanna, Lord, save us. And that's why we can say with those people and with so many more through this passion history, say from our hearts, Hail, King Jesus. Hail, King of the Jews. Amen. Please stand with me. And the peace of God which surpasses our understanding. Guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We join in confessing our faith in the Lord and Savior by saying the second article of the Apostles' Creed and then the meaning from the small catechism. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. He has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death. All this he did, that I should be his own, and live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from death, and lives and rules eternally. This is most certainly true. In the prayer of the church, we'll include petitions on behalf of our brother Don Lucas, who has been hospitalized, not for anything related to the coronavirus. Also, we pray on behalf of the family of Rosie Trich, who entered into her eternal rest this week. We pray. With loud hosannas we come before you, O Lord of hosts. We praise you for sending your sons, the King who came in your name to establish peace between heaven and earth. We're thankful that he did not consider himself too far above us to become true man. We deeply appreciate his fulfillment of the law, which we are unable to keep. We cannot adequately express our thanks that Christ took our punishment upon himself by dying on the cross. Send us your Holy Spirit to keep us on the path that leads to you. Help us to understand the temptations of Satan, the world, and our flesh. Grant us grace to live to your honor and glory, so that our lives will reflect our eternal gratitude for the salvation you won for us through your life of perfect obedience, Lord Jesus, and through your sacrificial suffering and death. O oh Lord, our Savior, we ask that you would be with our brother Don Lucas at this time. Give him healing, we pray, and recovery in the days and weeks to come. And especially strengthen him and his family with the certainty that you are working through all things, even all adversity, for the good of your people. Lord, we pray on behalf of Rosie Trich, his family. We pray that you would strengthen them with the certainty that she has now entered her eternal rest. She is waiting for that day when Jesus will raise us all up from our graves to take us to our heavenly home. Grant all of us that certainty that just as Christ is risen, we too shall rise. Lord, we pray on behalf of our world. So many people now struggling with fear and with other concerns in their lives. So many people affected with the loss of their jobs or livelihood. So many people struggling in so many ways. Lord, we ask that you would give peace. Give peace, first of all, to our hearts. Continue to use us Christians to spread the good news that in Christ there is forgiveness, there is love, there is eternal life. And then, Lord, we ask that you would also work to relieve the suffering of this day. Help those who are sick. Continue to bless those who are afraid and protect us from these viruses. Continue to bless us, Lord, according to your plan for our lives so that we may continue to glorify you all the days of this world as we look forward to our home in heaven. Grant peace in our time and help us to maintain we pray this in the name of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. We join together in the Lord's Prayer as he taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Bless the Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated as we sing the first two stanzas in 133.
God's blessings to all of you throughout these days. We will have a special devotion online for Monday, Thursday. We won't have a service. We will have a special service for Good Friday, live streamed at 7 p.m., and then celebrating Easter next Sunday. The Lord continue to be with you and bless you.